In this video, we're going to continue our discussion on how to write future-proof software. We're going to focus on design patterns in this lecture. First of all, a few credits. I certainly couldn't have done it without these credits. Uh, a few things I found are helpful in understanding design patterns. First is this website, sourcemaking.com. Anytime I have a design pattern I want to try to remember, a lot of times I'll pop out here and I can take a quick look and explore. The authority in design patterns is oftentimes considered this Gang of Four book, a book that's very common. It's one of the books that any good software developer should own. This was one of the first books that really documented what design patterns are, and it's considered kind of the official reference because it's named a lot of design patterns and many times you just say well according to the gang of four it's called the command pattern or something like that and of course there's also a uh, wikipedia a little bit of research out on there and there was a website i used to use that i don't see uh, available anymore called pattern depot so uh, that was a really nice reference on design patterns so nonetheless what is a design pattern well, the way that I the way that I describe design patterns a lot is tell me when you know what I'm talking about. Say two ounces of wheat mixed with water in yeast and then baked, uh, lettuce, tomato, onion, cheese, and then ground up beef. You know, eventually probably didn't take too long. You probably thought cheeseburger, but if I had just said cheeseburger, you'd know exactly what I'm talking about. So a design pattern is something where there's a concept that's complex, but there's a simple name that describes it. And this concept that's complex, what is it doing? Well, it's describing a problem that occurs over and over again, and then the design pattern is a solution or template that can be used to solve this problem. Now, the problem might occur in different domains. It might occur if we're an auto repair store. It might occur, it might occur if we're online commerce, or maybe if we're processing financial transactions. So it's a problem that's not specific to any industry or domain, but it's something that we see repeated in multiple domains over and over again. And so the design pattern is a way of thinking about a solution for this problem, and this design pattern can be applied in different ways. So stages of learning design patterns, this is really interesting because I saw my own journey through these stages and then I saw other people's journey through them as I started talking about design patterns in class. These stages of learning design patterns are provided from PatternDepot.com. So first of all, there's acceptance, the realization that learning design patterns is important. Then recognition, which is realized that you need to study patterns to know them. And then internalization is where you reach the aha factor, where you think about programming in patterns automatically. So this is a journey that will typically happen as you're learning design patterns. My goal for this video series is that you get to the acceptance stage and you just realize the important role that patterns play in programming. Over the next few years of practicing programming, taking other classes, and actually trying it out in real life, you'll likely go through the other phases as well as of recognition and internalization. Years ago, when I was teaching introductory programming, I had a student who managed a QA department, and he really enjoyed this thinking of design patterns. And he went back to work and he tried to apply it right away. And some of the developers he was working with said, oh, I'd never use that. But then what was funny is he showed them how they were already using design patterns without even knowing it. He showed them how they were using a factory pattern without even knowing that they were using the factory pattern. So some of these things just come as second nature and come as things that we automatically know about. We use a familiar process to describe design patterns. We'll typically put it in one of three categories. Creational. That means it's involved in creating objects out of classes. Structural. That means it's describing how classes are organized. In other words, do you have one class called vehicle? Or do you have a class called vehicle, a class called transmission, a class called engine, uh, a class called wheels, and so on and so forth? And you can aggregate these together through some kind of structure. Well, that's the structural design pattern, and that's actually not a pattern, but a category of design patterns. So in each of these three that I'm pointing out, there's several different design patterns that fit under each of these three categories. Finally, there's behavioral. Behavioral is describing how uh, objects operate with each other. In other words, how an object can invoke a method on another object. 
In our example, we're going to use one creational and one behavioral pattern. So we start with the category, then we have the name of the pattern, which is where I said cheeseburger versus wheat, yeast, and water, and ground beef, and so on and so forth. Uh, so the name is a simple name that is kind of something that any developer would know. Any developer who knows patterns would know. And by the way, this is a common interview question that I see and that I give as well, which is, what's your favorite design pattern? Then we'll have the problem that it solves, the way that it solves that problem, and any consequences of solving the problem that way. A good example is one of my favorite patterns, which is the command pattern. This is one we're going to use in our exercise. So the command pattern is a behavioral pattern. In other words, it's describing how objects act with each other. The problem that it's trying to solve is it's trying to decouple the invocation of an operation from the knowledge of how to perform that operation. In other words, one class is causing operations to occur without actually knowing what those operations are. That sounds really weird, but it's really powerful. Take a look at the UML diagram for the program that we're going to write. We have a class called Runner, and this is going to in, this is going to cause behavior to happen. It's going to invoke a series of methods. Okay. Uh, or, or, in other words, it's going to invoke a method on a series of objects. That might be a better way to explain it. Okay, what method is it going to invoke? Well, it's going to invoke the execute method. What's going to happen when it invokes that execute method? Well, it doesn't know, because it could be invoking execute on an annuity, or on a life insurance object, or on an employee object, or one of several other objects that we haven't even defined yet. So the runner is coordinating this invocation, but these individual classes know what's actually going to happen. And you see by having this interface in between the two, we have a level of indirection where the runner doesn't know any of the intimate details about how this execute method is actually going to be performed in a class called annuity, life insurance, employee, or whatever else might happen into the future. So solution, use interfaces as we just saw. And the consequence is you end up with several little classes as opposed to one big class, but in many ways that's a good thing. So that's one of the patterns we're going to use. Another pattern is an abstract factory pattern, and now we will uh, kind of do this at a high level. In other words, the world's simplest abstract factory. Abstract factory is really used when you need to create a bunch of objects that have a bunch of different configuration options, like a vehicle, a truck, a pizza something like that, where you have all kinds of different ways you can configure it. Uh, so the category is creational. The problem is to encapsulate these dependencies when creating an object. The solution is to provide an interface for creating the objects without specifying their core classes. Uh, and the consequence is that there are many different options in the creational design patterns. And in some ways, they compete with each other. So in some ways, you might use an abstract factory. Otherwise, you, other times, you might use a prototype or a builder or a factory method. So there are many different choices, many different options you can choose from. In our case, we're going to make the world's simplest abstract factory uh, pattern because what we're going to do is simply create objects of each of these uh, class types down here and perhaps any future classes that may happen. Uh, it, it's simple because these classes do one simple thing, annuity, life insurance, and employee. They're doing one simple thing. We don't need to aggregate together different engines and transmissions and doors and things like that. We're kind of just taking a simplified view, which is why I say a very simple abstract factory. Those are the two patterns that we are going to use in this example. But it's not the only pattern that we've seen in this video series. You might remember when we were talking about abstract classes and the two-string method, we talked about something called the template method design pattern. So that's another design pattern that we've seen before. Uh, another one that's very common is model view controller. Uh, there's a, I won't describe that here because we're not doing a, a full user interface implementation, but that's probably one of the more common. So. Uh, as I mentioned, this is, a, this is something that you'll likely hear of in an interview. Somebody might ask what your favorite design pattern is and how you'll apply it. There are probably somewhere in the 20s number of design patterns that are commonly known. 
Uh, very few people would know every single design pattern, but there are kind of a core set of design patterns that most people will understand. Uh, visitor, facade, uh, command factory, things like this, the ones that I've been talking through. Model view controller, definitely a lot of people know that. So my recommendation to you is to just pick a couple that you like, a few that are your favorite, and kind of keep those in the portfolio of your favorite design patterns. So with that, we will, uh, in our next few slides, we'll take a look, or in our next few videos, we'll take a look at an actual implementation of these patterns and how we can use these patterns to avoid if tests. So I look forward to seeing you in the coming videos. Thank you.